In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Wish all of you all the graces and blessings and happiness that flows from the Sacred Heart of Jesus, whose feast was yesterday, and we are in the octave of these eight days of, of adoration and contemplation and reparation to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And yesterday, normally, June 24th, would be the feast of St. John the Baptist's birthday, but it was, it was moved for obvious reasons of, of the higher rank of the Sacred Heart. So today is the Mass and Feast of the birthday of St. John the Baptist. And today is very, very filled because it's not only the feast of St. William as well, who was a holy abbot who worked many miracles, but uh, a very rare picture uh, on the epistle side of the altar, you see the martyrdom of St. Febronia, who was a virgin and martyr around the 300s, somewhere in what would be modern-day Turkey. And so briefly about her, because I can't let this day pass without mentioning her, especially with her picture on the wall. You can see her being beaten, and that was just one phase of her martyrdom. She was a holy nun. She was known for her, ex her extraordinary beauty. And as a young girl, she consecrated her life to Jesus Christ. And many men sought her, many men wanted to marry her, but she wanted to marry Christ. So she chose, needless to say, she chose the best husband. And she would enter the, car, the convent, virgin nuns, and she would end up being the abbess. And she would teach her nuns, they would read the scriptures, and she would teach them according to what she heard from the great fathers of the time, St. Augustine, St. John Chrysostom, St. Basil the Great. And she would pass on what they taught to the sisters. And many people from the town, many, many faithful would come to be instructed by her to brought, be brought from paganism to the Catholic faith. So she brought many conversions. And of course, this put the word out during one of the great persecutions, probably under Diocletian, that she was arrested. And she was brought before the judges. And there was a whole panel of judges that she was standing before, and the, the, head, the head judge in the middle. And they interrogated her, and her answers were very clear, very simple. Yes, I am a Christian, which meant a Catholic. I am a Christian, and I am married to Jesus Christ, and I have consecrated myself to him. And so the judge said, well, you must burn incense to the gods of Rome. And she said, oh, there's only one true God, and I don't burn incense to devils. So they said, the judge said to her, well, don't you know that I have power to strip, I have power to strip you, and I have power to beat you and kill you. So burn incense to the gods. And St. Fabronia, she said, at that point they tore off her clothes, and she said, I strip. She said, I am stripped like an athlete that, is, that strips for the race, that, like a wrestler that strips for the wrestling match down to bare, bare bones, or the bare minimum clothes, in order to wrestle and defeat you, you and your father, the devil. So she wouldn't back down. And filled with the Holy Ghost, she basically said, go ahead, beat me, crush me, tear me apart, burn me and killed me. You will never separate me from the love of Jesus Christ. And how true those words came to be. Because she was rolled over broken pottery and glass and nails. And she was, the, she cut off, they cut off the part, the noble part of her body that mothers would nurse their children with. She was burnt, she was stretched out on the rack, she was whipped, her tongue was ripped out, 
and other parts of her face were clawed and ripped out and cut off, ear lobes and eye, eye lids and so forth. And then still persevering and filled with the Holy Ghost, she was beheaded. So that's the, today is the day of her martyrdom in the early 300s, St. Febronia. So pray to her, pray to her for an equal courage, an equal strength to profess and live the Holy Catholic faith in another pagan world, perhaps worse than what she had. And of course, today is St. John the Baptist's birthday. And the scripture tells of his coming in Isaiah, in Jeremiah rather, chapter 1, verse 17. Thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise and speak to them all that I command thee. Be not afraid of their presence, for I will make thee not to fear their countenance. So St. John the Baptist would not fear, for example, to correct Herod publicly, who was living in adultery with his brother's wife. For behold, I have made thee this day a fortified city and a pillar of iron and a wall of brass over all the land to the kings of Judah, to the princes thereof, and to the priests and to the people of the land. So St. John the Baptist would, would even stand up to the corrupted Jewish priests and high priests and Pharisees. And he would e even call them a brood of vipers. <laughs> a, in other words, a snake nest. You can't get more insulting than that. But he leveled it out for these hi hypocritical Pharisees because the Jewish priests were supposed to recognize the Redeemer and adore the Messiah when he came. But they rejected even the voice crying in the wilderness, St. John the Baptist. So St. John the Baptist, he corrected them. And they shall fight against thee and shall not prevail, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. The prophecy of Jeremiah about St. John the Baptist. And then we see in St. John the Baptist, the we can see in the Lauds and Vespers, the hymns, the antiphons, you can see the summary of St. John the Baptist's role and vocation. Elizabeth, Zachary's wife, has brought forth a great man, John the Baptist, the forerunner of the Lord. They made signs to his father how he would have him called, and he wrote, saying, John is his name. His name shall be called John, and many shall rejoice at his birth. Among those who are born of women, our Lord said here, among those who are born of women, a greater has not risen than John the Baptist. Thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High. Thou shalt go before the Lord to prepare his ways. So the greatness of St. John the Baptist is, is even spoken by Christ himself. And the first time St. John the Baptist would meet Christ was in the womb of of his mother, St. Elizabeth, who in her old age conceived, miraculously conceived, six months before the Virgin Mary conceived of, the, of Christ in her womb. And when at the visitation, the second joyful mystery of the Holy, the joyful mysteries of the Rosary, when Our Lady carrying Jesus Christ in her womb, and Our Lady not probably not showing yet in her in her womb, but Elizabeth was six months with St. John the Baptist, so she was certainly showing. And when the light of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, that burning fire, approached to St. Elizabeth, all the fathers of the church teach this, that the light of Jesus Christ, the presence of Jesus Christ, gave St. John the Baptist at six months old in his mother's womb the state of sanctifying grace. So he was, it was as if he was baptized. He was baptized by the divine fire of the Sacred Heart of Jesus in the womb of the Virgin Mary. So he leapt and danced with joy. And he leapt and danced as David in the Old Testament leapt and danced with joy before the ark 
of the covenant. And this dancing before the ark for, for King David was be, the ark held the, the manna of the desert, it held the rod of Aaron, and it held the tablets of the Ten Commandments. So it was very sacred. And, and David danced before the ark. And this was prefiguring St. John the Baptist, who would dance before the true ark, the true and holy ark, the Virgin Mary, who would carry in her the manna, but the living bread of heaven, Jesus Christ, who would carry in her womb the priesthood. The rod of Aaron prefigured the Catholic priesthood. And thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And that's the Catholic priesthood that will offer the sacrifice of bread and wine changed into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. And Melchizedek is this mysterious figure in the Old Testament who was greater than Abraham and offers the sacrifice to God, but it's not the blood of animals, it's not the blood of goats and lambs, it's bread and wine. And this prefigures the Mass, absolutely prefigures the Mass. And the prophecy of the minor prophet Malachi, in chapter, I think it's chapter 1 or chapter 11, where he says, In all nations, everywhere, there will be offered to me an oblation, a clean oblation, which is the unbloody sacrifice of the Mass. So in every place, from the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun, there will be offered a clean oblation everywhere on the earth. This is the prophecy of the sacrifice of the Mass, which is clean because it's not splashing with blood, but that's what it really is. It's a mystical sacrifice, but a real sacrifice. That's the Mass. And Christ is that priest. So Mary is that true ark of all holiness carrying God in her womb, the high priest, Jesus Christ. And then the, the tablets of stone of commandments, the Ten Commandments, Jesus Christ will fulfill all the law and the prophets. So when St. John the Baptist danced before the ark, which is the Virgin Mary, with great joy, he had received sanctifying grace. And then others, some are of the opinion, and this is disputed, but I just say some fathers of the church say that St. Joseph, and it makes sense that he would not let Mary travel alone. It was a long distance of several days to go to the area of Bethlehem from Nazareth. And it was about an eight-day trip. So certainly, most likely, St. Joseph accompanied Our Lady. And St. Joseph didn't know that Our Lady had already conceived of Almighty God in her womb. But when St. Joseph approaching St. Elizabeth, coming out to greet the Virgin Mary from her house, when he hears the words from St. Elizabeth say to Mary, who am I? She's smiling with great joy, but she says, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? In other words, who am I that the mother of God comes to visit me? So she's calling her mother of God. And for the sake of Protestants, it's, it's an obvious, why don't they call her mother of God? Why do they have such a problem calling her the mother of God when it's in the Bible? It's written in the Bible. Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And St. John the Baptist receives St. Divine Grace. St. Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Ghost. And Our Lady, also filled with the Holy Ghost, says the great prayer, the Magnificat. But St. Joseph, when he hears these words, it clicks. And this is where his troubles begin. Because he's realizing, if Our Lady is chosen to be the mother of the Messiah, and I'm chosen to be her husband, I'm not worthy for this. And that aid at St. Joseph, and it will, it will drive him, his, the feeling of his complete unworthiness would drive him to finally leave Our Lady. Because just because of unworthy, he felt so unworthy, but that's when the angel would come to St. Joseph and say, don't worry, don't fear Joseph to take Mary for your lawful wife because that which is conceived in her is by the Holy Ghost. And 
he will she will give forth the birth to the the Messiah from the house of Jacob and his kingdom shall have no end so st. John the Baptist his great words will always echo throughout all of history even today today is June the 25th this is the day after the the normal feast of St. John the Baptist, June 24th. And from now on, the days will get shorter until December and Christmas, when Christ is born. And then when Christ is born on December 25th, the days start increasing all the way to June 24th and 25th, which is the longest day of the year, when the light expands over the darkness until June until June 24th and 25th. So what does all this mean? Well, St. John the Baptist said to Christ, pointing to Christ, he said, he must increase, I must decrease. And this is the whole, really the whole recipe, the whole mentality of St. John the Baptist and all the saints. Christ must increase, the glory of God must increase, I must decrease. What matters is the glory of God, not me. What matters is the glory of Jesus Christ as king, as high priest, as the only redeemer, as the only savior. And I'm, I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness. I'm, and the saints all have that spirit of the glory given to God. And St. John the Baptist, he must increase, I must decrease. So the church year even shows this on the natural level. As after now, the birth of St. John the Baptist, the days start decreasing until December 25th. And after 25th, the days start increasing. So he must increase, I must decrease. <laughs> so even the church year reflects this, this beauty of, of this truth. And of course, St. John the Baptist will be fearless to even oppose public leaders. St. John the Baptist is an example of what popes and bishops and priests are supposed to do when there's political leaders that are scandalous, causing scandals. And even in the church, when there's scandals of churchmen, better that scandal arise, says St. Gregory, than the truth be silent. So sometimes, especially when it's public and known, these scandals must be openly rebuked. So we have the great example of Archbishop Lefebvre, who imitated St. Paul to St. Peter in Galatians chapter 2, and resisted the Pope to his face, and resisted his scandals of preaching a new gospel, the new gospel of ecumenism, the new gospel of religious liberty, the, the uncrowning of Christ the King. The new gospel of collegiality, that there's two supreme powers in the church instead of one. The new gospel of a new mass, new sacraments, new priesthood, new catechism, new philosophy, new theology, a whole new religion, as Archbishop Lefebvre said. And he said, we don't have anything to do with this new religion of Vatican II. If I, says St. Paul, or an angel, preach to you another gospel, or an angel from heaven preach to you another gospel other than what you have received, let him be anathema. So tradition is already set and cannot be changed by any pope or bishop or priest. So Archbishop Lefebvre, like St. John the Baptist, stood opposed to public scandal and exposed it and corrected it. And of course, like St. John the Baptist, his head was cut off by the phony excommunication. And I repeat, and I'll always repeat, it's a great shame that the four bishops have asked Pope Benedict XVI to lift the excommunication that was a badge of honor. For Archbishop Lefebvre, he said it was a badge of honor to be excommunicated from this church of Assisi, from this church of evolution, this church of Vatican II and ecumenism. And to their shame, they asked that it be lifted. And maybe that's why the four bishops have, all of them in some way, have become soft, become compromising, become, become not voices 
crying through the wilderness, but, but little whimpering squeaks. You no longer hear them preaching against the scandals of Pope Francis. Just recently, Pope Bishop Tissier, Bishop Tissier de Malere, one of the greatest of the four bishops, who in June of 2012 preached a great sermon at the ordinations, and he was saying, we cannot make an agreement with modernist Rome. Rome must come back to the Catholic faith. Rome must proclaim the kingship of Christ. And he was repeating what Archbishop Lefebvre always said. And then later at table, the priest who was then at that time district superior of the United States, he said in front of all the priests at table, you, your sermon was divisive. <laughs> and yeah, truth is divisive, isn't it? But last, just a couple weeks ago, Bishop Tissier gave a sermon at the ordinations. It was a very good sermon, but no mention of Vatican II, no mention of the new mass, no mention of the scandals of Pope Francis, no mention of, he did mention Archbishop Lefebvre as being a priest who labored and worked hard to save souls and loved the mass. But Archbishop Lefebvre wasn't just about the mass and saving souls, and all that is important and it's all good. But Archbishop Lefebvre shines in this era because he stood opposed to modernism destroying the Catholic Church. That's his great crown in heaven. That was his moral martyrdom. That was his beheading, being excommunicated by these modernist popes. That was a terrible, terrible cross for Archbishop Lefebvre. But he understood and saw correctly these are null and void excommunications and suspensions. Just like St. Athanasius could say, these excommunications of Pope Liberius is null and void. Null and void. And they're a badge of honor. So, Arch so Archbishop Lefebvre, how closely he resembles St. John the Baptist. And St. John the Baptist would pay for it with his head. And with a dance, an immoral, lustful dance, his head would be the price of that dance. So St. John Vianney used to always condemn, he would base a lot of his sermons on that dance of uh, Herodias, his, her daughter, the sinful dances, the sinful dances. And by that he means all the lustful dancing and the slow dances and close bodily contact dances. These are sinful. But in most in Catholic countries, they do have healthy, good dances, we could say, that even St. Francis de Sales encouraged. And he said, yes, you can go to these dances that are not immoral, that are not sinful, that are uh, in groups with families and parishes, whatever. But we must avoid the immoral dances, obviously. So St. John the Baptist, how he shines, and this is He's the only one other than our Lord Jesus Christ and the Virgin Mary that has a birthday as a feast of the church. So that shows the greatness of St. John the Baptist. So let's pray to him to imitate his zeal for our Lord Jesus Christ, his zeal for the faith, his love for the truth. His penances, well, this is a case, <laughs> this is a case where saints are often to be admired they're always to be admired, but not always imitated. Because most of us would probably die if we tried to live on a diet of honey and locusts and walked around with camel skin. So obviously, the saints and their penances are not always to be imitated. And St. Francis de Sales speaks about this a lot. He says many people fall into that idea, well, unless I do those penances of the saints, and great saints, I'm not going to be a saint. And St. Francis de Sales always makes the point, that's not what makes saints. It's the interior mortification that's most necessary. And the church gives us external mortification. The fasts, the ember days, some of the vigils. And these penances are good. And some physical penances are good, but not always the way the saints did it. Because, quite honestly, it would kill most of us. 
And even St. Bernard regretted that he fasted so much as a young man because in his older age he always had gastric problems, stomach problems. He couldn't digest right because he, and he admitted, I overdid it. So there's a place for mortification and penance. But again, the saints are always to be admired, not always imitated. And some saints, like Our Lady of Fatima, told the children of Fatima, the best penance is to do your duties of state most perfectly and accept the crosses that God sends in your duties of state. And there's plenty of those, as we all know, crosses of daily life, getting stuck in traffic, cutting your finger, peeling potatoes, cancel of canceled flights, injuries, humiliations, whatever it be. These are crosses that God is very pleased with. And the, the big cross of our day, of course, is the penance of the state of the church. How we all groan, how we all lament the state of our Catholic Church. The papacy in the grip of Marxism and modernism. Bishops who are cowards, total jellyfish. And even with this great occasion, a happy and victorious occasion of the overthrow for once, finally, the overthrow of the Roe versus Wade decision of 1973, which has brought over 60 million American boys and girls to a bloody butchery in their own mother's wombs. And that's not counting all the abortions caused by contraception. So the bishops are silent. Even the Pope is silent. They should be rejoicing and praising this and telling the Catholic people, let's work now that all the states of the United States, all 50 states overthrow these abortion laws. But the bishops, as usual, are silent. And Our Lady of, of, uh, Our Lady of Quito in Ecuador, she said, many souls will be lost because of silence of the bishops and priests. Those who should speak out remain silent. And, and the first duty of bishops is to teach the faith. So, write to Bishop Williamson, encourage him to teach the faith. But the way Archbishop Lefebvre did, not with the nonsense of the new mass giving grace, not with the nonsense of the new mass miracles. But teach the faith, not fuzzy garbage. The faith. Write to Bishop Zendeos, please teach us the faith. We don't hear you. We don't hear your voice. And the public domain now is internet. As much as we don't like it and we don't care for it, it is the vehicle to reach souls. So write to Bishop Zendeas. He's here in the United States. Write to him. He's up in uh, Emmett sometimes. I'm here at St. Mary's. So write to him and beg him, please teach the faith. And Bishop Tissier, he used to be a lion roaring against modernism and the conciliar church. He used to be so clear in teaching against the conciliar religion and against all compromise with the Vatican II religion and all, all false agreements. But now he's just, he's preaching good doctrine, but it's not, you know, you can't, you can't fight a boxing match with one arm, with one hand. You need both hands to fight in a boxing match. If you got one hand behind your back, you're, in, you're going to be destroyed. So yes, there must be the right hand, there must be the left hand punch of good doctrine, teaching about saints and holiness and the mass and the, the, the basic catechism. That's essential. But you need also the right punch that often give, is the knocker, this is the one that knocks out your opponent. The right punch of the condemnations against modernism the fight against the conciliar religion, the false sacraments of the Vatican II, the new mass. We have to preach against these things because they are in fact today, right now, taking thousands of souls to hell. And the scandals of Pope Francis and the silence of the, all the bishops, novice ordo and traditional bishops, are taking many souls to hell right now as I speak. There are souls today, right now, dying right now, who could be saved if the Pope did his duty, if the bishops preached the faith. 
and preached with the right hand punch against the errors of our time, as St. Athanasius preached against the errors of his time, Arianism, and St. Basil, and St. Augustine, and St. Jerome, and St. Gregory the Seventh preached against the errors of his time, and all the great saints in, in every era of, of history, they preached against the errors of their time, like St. John Fisher. St. John Fisher did not pull punches in the Diocese of Rochester in England. And his, that church is still standing. I've, I've walked into that church. It's a magnificent stone Gothic church. And he would preach there against the scandals of King Henry VIII. And he said he has no right to marry another woman. He's married till he dies. And for that, he was arrested, he was taken, and beheaded. And he opposed the scandals of, that, of, the, of the bad leaders. So this is the duty of bishops. So let's pray for our bishops, especially our traditional bishops. They'll have a lot to answer. And I ask you to pray particularly for Bishop Fillet, who has led this direction of compromise, this, this direction of handshaking and embracing the conciliar false religion, and signing the doctrinal declaration of April 15, 2012, exactly 100 years after the sinking of the Titanic, the sinking of the SSPX. So pray for him, because that before he dies, that he retracts and condemns these, the signing of this document and all the steps he's taken to sink the good boat of the SSPX into compromise and modernism. So that now they're even approving books that support evolution, like Pope Father Paul Robinson, who's now, he's prior out in Denver, Colorado. He's in a very high position and he's promoting evolution. How is this possible? When evolution directly attacks the very being of who God is. So let's pray for them, pray for them. Because these are confusing times. These are, we could say, scary times. But the Holy Ghost gives us not to be scared. And look at, look at St. Febronia being butchered. Was she scared? Maybe on her human side, yes. But filled with the Holy Ghost, she overcame all these torments and died smiling. And this saint here, burning alive, I forgot which saint it was, but she's burning alive and all the saints who went to death with the fortitude of the Holy Ghost. So let's pray to the Holy Ghost to give our bishops fortitude, to give us fortitude and wisdom and understanding and all the gifts, especially of piety, to love God as our Father. And we see that in the Sacred Heart of Jesus, our Father who so loved us that he sent his only begotten Son, who carries in his heart the wound right in his physical heart. So when he showed the heart to St. Margaret Mary, it was on fire with the wound and surrounded by thorns. And that heart of Jesus, right now in heaven, with his real body, he has the scar of the wound of the soldier that lanced his heart. They will look upon him whom they have pierced. We have all pierced him by our sins in that his heart right now in heaven has the scar. And forever, for all eternity, in a million years, five billion years, that heart will always have the scar of the proof of his love for us. And such love should move us to love him in return. Not just the wound in his heart, but the five wounds in the hands and feet. They all shout out the love of the sacred heart for each of us. So let's return that love for love as the saints all did. O oh, Mary conceived without sin, O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. And for those who do not have recourse to thee, especially all communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church, Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen.